Surveillance cameras are very much a double-edged sword. In almost every modernised town and city, they are everywhere. It uneases the nerves to know that in public, every move you make is being monitored everywhere you go. But it can also be comforting to know that, should you ever go missing, surveillance cameras may be the single thing that helps find you, or explains why. My name's Adrian, and welcome back to Coffeehouse Crime. Today we're looking at the case of Berna Bradstutir, who in the early hours of a cold January morning, vanished, and surveillance cameras that would help solve her disappearance. But before we get into our case today, I wanted to take a small moment to thank those of you that have subscribed to Coffeehouse Crime. When I started my channel just over a few weeks ago, I had no idea that I would connect to over a thousand of you in such a short period of time. I feel so lucky to share my stories with so many of you already, so thank you. I won't hammer on, but I thought this milestone deserved a new shirt and an updated coffee house. Okay, with that out of the way, I have an interesting story to share with you today. So sit back and grab a coffee. This is the case of Berna Brandstottir. Deep in the North Atlantic Ocean lies a sleepy and often forgotten island called Iceland. Iceland as a country has an entire population of only 357,000 inhabitants. Well characterised for its snow, waterfalls, northern lights and more modernly for its blue lagoon, Iceland is also a country with a population focused on simplicity, honesty and togetherness. Iceland's capital, Reykjavik, is home to roughly one third of the country's population, and one of those inhabitants, her name, was Berna Bradstotir. Berna was a 20-year-old woman, and to the usual passerby, she was just a sales assistant to one of the city's several fashion shops. In 2017, Berna was living with her father in the suburb of Breerholt in Reykjavik. Although her mother and father had split up, she was still on good terms with both of them, and talked to both of them on a daily basis. She loved music, dancing, and having fun. She was bright, responsible, and nurturing and described by her friends as a kind, fun-loving redhead with a great sense of humour. Other than enjoying a good time with her friends, she also loved music, and with that she would often frequent the city's bars and nightclubs every Friday evening. And on the evening of Friday the 13th of January 2017, it was the same as all other Fridays. Berna, she had a busy day at work, full of its stresses, and she was ready to let loose at a local bar with friends. They hit a local bar after work, and shared a few games of cards as they drank and as the evening progressed, so did their spirits. They soon after headed to Hura, a local nightclub in the centre of the city. Hura is one of the city's most vibrant venues, offering premier live music and a great night out. Both local and famous bands frequently perform here to the city's nighttime punters. And shortly after they got there, lively and carefree, Berna was one of the first people to get up on the stage and start dancing away. And their time in Hura, with all the dancing and partying and drinking, quickly turned the hours over. By the time the clock had struck 2am, while Berna was still enjoying her evening, her friends were growing tired. They told her they wanted to leave, but Berna, she decided that she would stay at the nightclub. The club hammered on, and so did Berna. Right through to the end, in fact. At 5am, the club's lights switched on. It was closing time, and with the end to the night, Berna decided it was time to go back home to her father's house to catch some sleep. Shortly after leaving the club, she bought a flaffle pitter from a local takeaway before making her way through to Laugvegur, a brightly lit street with glowing storefronts and illuminating lamp posts. She was walking alone, and this was not unusual in Reykjavik. Even for a young woman, with the country's crime rate extremely low, the place is considered safe for all. It was minus 9 degrees Celsius that early morning though, with wind chill giving the air a particularly strong bite. As she walked home, Berna was seen on CCTV wearing the outfit that she'd had on since finishing her shift the evening before. Black Doc Martin boots, black jeans, a grey jumper and a black hoodie. Her hair hung loose, and a pair of white earbuds dangled around her neck. And following her enjoyable night, Berna was drunk. Surveillance cameras captured her accidentally bumping into strangers on the pavement, and dropping coins outside a shop. She ambled past the yellow and red awning of the Lebowski bar, and a coffee shop which backed onto a street corner where a narrow lane then leads down to the sea. 
but after appearing on the footage of this camera, nestled on Laugfuga Street at 5.25am, Bernard Bradstatir, she vanished. This would actually be the last time she was ever seen alive again. Berna never showed up for work the next morning. She was actually supposed to be working with one of her long-term best friends, Maria. The two had met in primary school, and had also been working at the same shop for quite some time. It was unlike Berna to miss a day at work, or at least if she ever did, she would call in advance to let everyone know. Maria tried to call Berna's mobile phone, but it went straight through to voicemail. It was also unlike Berna to have her phone switched off. This raised Maria's suspicion, so she contacted one of Berna's friends who had went out there the night before. She too hadn't seen her since 2am. The two contacted Berna's mother, Scylla, and Scylla she too hadn't heard from her daughter. She started to grow concerned pretty quickly, and by the afternoon she'd contacted the police to file a missing persons report. Since it was a very strange and unusual case, police they were very quick to pick up on Berna's case. And in the first 24 hours, under their initial investigation, is when they found the surveillance footage of Berna roaming the streets that early Saturday morning. And through tracking her mobile phone's GPS, police then managed to find that she'd made it to a location near a mobile tower in Hafnafugur, an industrial area in a port town six miles south of Reykjavik. But other than this initial boost of data, nothing else stood out to police officers. Berna, she was still missing, and police were none the wiser to figure out where she'd gone. Scylla was starting to grow very concerned, so she reached out to Facebook, and the news of Berna's disappearance there spread like wildfire across the country. By the time three days had passed, huge amounts of attention was focused on Berna. Police were so fired up about the case that they assigned their top officer to investigate. His name was Grimmer Grimson. Grimmer was a private person, but he was by no means unnoticed. In his 30 years in the police force as a detective, he'd almost seen it all. This included investigations into petty crimes, right through to enduring multiple avalanches while posted in the northern Wetfjords. Only in November 2016 had he returned to Reykjavik's police force, missing the, uh, faster pace of life. Scrutinising the surveillance footage of Berna shortly after she left the bar, Grimson and his colleagues noticed a small red car travelling in the opposite direction to Berna. It drove past the Lebowski bar less than 30 seconds after she'd appeared on camera there. It was insignificant, but it stood out to officers. The license plate on the car, however, was illegible, and when police checked the National Vehicle Database, they found more than 100 cars of the same make, model, and colour. In the early morning hours of January the 16th, two brothers who were part of the search team to find Berna were down at the docks of Hafnafjörder. This was the place that Berna's mobile phone was last located. They had been searching for quite some time, and they hadn't found anything of interest. They decided to check the harbour one last time, so they decided to walk towards it, going past an open patch of land next to Atlantsolia supply station. That is when they came across a pair of boots, and upon closer inspection, they were Doc Martens. They believed it belonged to Berna, and police would later confirm this too. This was the first real piece of evidence to link Berna to this harbour, and the prognosis didn't look too promising for her either. Back in the city, detectives were also making their own progress too. They'd been analysing additional CCTV footage, and when they checked the harbour, that's when they saw the red Kia again on Saturday morning at 6am. The car parked along a 65 metre trawler called the Polar Nanok. It was a ship owned by Greenland. The footage isn't publicly available, but what it shows is a man leaving the Red Kia from the passenger's side, and slowly, drunkenly, walking back towards the ship. The car then drives off. This time though, the license plate was legible. After a quick investigation, Grimson was able to locate the car back to a rental vehicle company. The car had been rented out by a crewmate on the Polar Nanok, and that guy's name was Thomas Möller Olsen. Thomas Möller Olsen was a fisherman from Greenland, he was visiting the island as part of work, and he'd arrived via the Polar Nanok. And honestly, that's all there really is to him. He's a fisherman, and he did have a small criminal record for buying and selling hashish, but otherwise he's a pretty boring guy. At around lunchtime on Saturday, Thomas had returned his hired red Kia to the rental company, 
and since Grimson's discovery, it had been hired out again to another family. Police located and impounded the car, but by the time they got there, it was pretty obvious that the car had been recently cleaned. The new owners of the rented vehicle had complained about the smell in the back seat. And upon closer inspection, police would also find traces of blood on the back seat. They would take a sample of that, along with Berner's DNA, and send both to a laboratory for forensic analysis. Police also confirmed that there was damage to the underside of the car, suggesting it was probably driven off-road on trails where small compact cars shouldn't be driven. There was also over 300 kilometers racked up on the pedometer while in Thomas's hands, something that couldn't be explained. With the ever-growing suspicion luring its head towards Thomas Olsen, the hunt for him was now on. It wasn't difficult to locate him though, he was on a boat, it's just that boat had already left, and it was over 100 miles away in Greenland's waters. This was a bit of a challenge for Iceland's police. Thomas, he was a Greenland citizen, on a boat owned by Greenland, which was now in the territorial waters of Greenland. They couldn't really do much to stop him, and had a lot of reliance on the neighbouring country to help. But on the boat, gossip started to spread about the Red Kia. And apparently Thomas, when he heard the news, he went pale. He was so panicked, in fact, that he needed to be sedated. Yeah, you can't really run away from this one, mate. This is where we meet another hero to the story, though. The captain of the Polar Nanok, he'd heard the news too about the Red Kia and he also understood the diplomatic challenges that Iceland's police would face. So what did he do? He told the crew that the boat had a motor problem, and so he turned the boat around and started sailing back the other way towards Iceland's harbour. He also turned the Wi-Fi off so no one on the ship could gather news or gossip about the case. What a guy. As soon as the Polar Nanok entered Icelandic waters, six of Iceland's Viking squad, the country's top police officers, repelled onto the Polar Nanok via helicopter, and arrested Thomas. They also arrested his drunken friend Nikolai, who had accompanied him in the Red Kia that Friday night. By the time the two were in custody, forensic analysis results on the blood found in the back of the car had returned. And unfortunately, to add to the ever-unfolding evidence, it was confirmed to belong to Berner. Both Thomas and Nikolai denied causing any harm to Berner. According to their statements, they'd both gone for a night out in the town on Friday. Nikolai took a taxi from the harbour to Reykjavik, and went for a drink in the English pub just off Laugvegur. He then paid 2,500 krona for a spin of the lucky wheel, and won the grand prize of eight beers. By the time Thomas had driven the rental car to the capital and joined Nikolai, Nikolai was already very drunk. They later moved to another bar before going for a drive, and at roughly 5am during that time of that drive is when Berner and another woman, they'd both entered the car. Nikolai, though, he was so drunk that he didn't remember any other details after that. He passed out on the way to the harbour. Thomas told police that after dropping Nikolai off at the Polar Nanok, he then drove the car to the end of the harbour, and got into the back seats with both women. He apparently then started making out with Berner before dropping them both off at a local roundabout. And apparently that was it. But you can probably tell by now that that's not actually what happened. We know this because police caught Thomas on surveillance footage leaving the harbour at around 7am, and then again in a shop, buying cleaning products. Other evidence was also weighing against Thomas too. The doctor who examined him had noted scratches on his chest, and officers searching his cabin in the Polar Nanok would also find 23 kilograms of hashish, with a street value of roughly 1.4 million pounds. And more notably, police also found Berner's driver's licence, it was located in the ship's rubbish tip. Pieces of evidence were finally starting to come together around Thomas and Berner. Around 11.45am on the 22nd of January, just nine days after Berner disappeared, search efforts were still going strong for her. Around 830 volunteers were active that day. And that's when a Coast Guard helicopter flying low over the coastline by Selzvog's Vitti Lighthouse spotted something near the water's edge. There was no typical beach there, only cliffs and beams of black stones. In contrast to the rock was a large, pale object. There they would find a body. And, to everyone's biggest fears, that body would belong to Berner. Autopsy reports found that she had been struck in the face and strangled, near to the point of death. There were no signs of sexual assault, only of grievous bodily harm. 
but the hardest revelation was that she had not died in the car, but from drowning, most likely in the sea's freezing temperatures. Iceland grieved for Berna. Back in Reykjavik, thousands of people walked together down the streets, leaving candles and flowers in the areas Berna was last seen on camera. Her funeral was held at the biggest church in the country, and had over 2,000 attendees, including both of Iceland's president and prime minister. Her discovery and funeral seemed to do no less than ignite and add further pressure to Thomas's trial. With evidence ever unfolding both to him and to the public's eyes, it was very clear that he was responsible for Berna's murder. Investigations also concluded that Nikolai had no part to this crime. Apart from being horrendously drunk that morning, he was dropped off at the harbour before the attack started. He was then later discharged from police two days after her funeral. So on March the 30th, 2017, Thomas was charged with Berna's murder, and also for drug possession. When his trial began in August, the prosecution's case was even stronger. Thomas's DNA was found on the laces of one of Berna's boots, and Norwegian forensic scientists had identified his fingerprints on her driver's license. He confessed to drug possession, but not to murder. And to everyone's surprise, while he was being trialled, he spoke to the court in a low voice with no emotion, spinning a completely new story to the judge and jury. Instead of two girls in the car, it was now only one, Berna, who he had said suddenly climbed into the Kia Rio as he drove along Laugvega. Thomas said he had stopped the car and got out to have a pee, at which point Nikolai drove off with Berna, returning some time later without her. To the astonishment of everyone in the court, Thomas was now, at this late stage in the process, trying to pin the murder on his fellow crewmate. This didn't work, however, because in November 2018, Thomas was found guilty of Berna's murder, and also of drug smuggling. He was sentenced to 19 years in prison, in addition to the repayment of 29 million krona in costs and compensation. I'm really starting to see a pattern here in my videos, you know. First New Zealand, and then the United Kingdom, and then Japan, and now Iceland. Why are these murderers getting away with such short sentences? In America, most of these cases, there'd be life sentences without the possibility of parole. Berna was an outgoing, courageous, fun-loving free spirit. She lived life to the full. And for her entire life to be taken away for just 19 years of this scumbag, it doesn't seem right. Berna's killer to this date still hasn't revealed a motive. In fact, he still pleads not guilty. And to the residents of Iceland and their way of life, it's unfathomable to understand anyway. Despite this case, I've never visited Iceland, but it's definitely on my list. The country's way of life and natural beauty sounds too good to miss. With its waterfalls, lava fields, and spectacular night skies, I can see why its native population are amongst one of the happiest out there. Berna lived and loved every second of her life, and I think that's quite a resounding ambition that Iceland's folk have. Thank you so much for watching another video of mine today. I hope you enjoyed the case. And thank you to those that have subscribed to Coffeehouse Crime already. If you haven't yet, then please do. It really does mean a lot to me. What do you think about Berner's case? And what do you think about Thomas Olsen? And why do you think he did it? Please let me know in the comments below, and I'll get back to you. And if you have any suggestions for cases in the future, please feel free to leave them there too. Thank you once again, folks, and I'll see you real soon in the next one. Until then, please take care of each other. Goodbye.